Lots of people think that founding of the American government is kind of crass, that it understands that people are selfish and it sets them off against each other so that they can't hurt each other. Uh, and there's some color of truth to that. It means that if people are going to be self-governing and run the government and hold the sovereignty, they need to be good people. Well, how does the Constitution help produce such people? It's an interesting thing. Uh, the purpose of the government of the United States is to protect our rights, our freedom, all of that. That's surely true and powerful. But also, it's interested in our character, in building our character, in helping us to be better than George Washington claims, speaking words that were actually written by James Madison in his first inaugural, that if we become better people, we will be happier people. You have to think for a minute about these founders. Because before they were founders of a political system, what did they do? How did uh, Alexander Hamilton get to know George Washington? Through the war. Yeah. They were warriors. They conquered, right? They signed a document, they put their name on the line, and they fought a war, and they won it. And the implication in all of human history is that now they're going to get to rule. They're going to be the kings in the court. There's a story, and it might not be true, and it might be true. There's, there's uh, evidence both ways, which means you don't know if it's true, really. I would uh, rue the day that anybody proved it didn't happen. And the story is that King George III could not be brought to call the peace conference after they had given up after the Battle of Yorktown. Because, you know, uh, my wife is English and I adore her in her country, but we did really kick them pretty hard there in the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, one of the ministers says to the king, uh, sire, we have to call a peace conference. He'd uh, lost the new world. Think of that. You understand, by the way, there can never be another new world. We know the world now. We have to go some other planet, I guess. And the king, he's got to be thinking, isn't that awesome? We've got all of that, and then they lost it all. He said, reportedly, George Washington will not know how to be a king. They will want me back. You see the assumption? He conquered, now he's the king. That's how it works, right? And the minister is reported to have said, I understand that he has resigned his office and gone home. And the king said, if that is true, he's the greatest man in the world. Which he was, by the way, for that reason. When you get all that right, then it emerges that you have to set it up in some way so that it won't collapse of its own weight. Uh, who is the chairman of the Constitutional Convention? George Washington. Washington. Yeah. And they needed him. Mm -hmm. They really needed him. He was the name to conjure with. If they announced that there was going to be a constitutional convention, that they are the, kind, the Confederation Congress appointed or called the convention, if they announced that he was going to be the chairman of it, then that's extremely reassuring, right? And he almost didn't come. And the reason is he was a member of the Society of Cincinnatus. Do you know what that is? Cincinnatus was a Roman thing. Tim, you're about to tell us. Well, Cincinnatus, like, kind of similar to George Washington, was called up as a, he was just a farmer, and he was called up as a general, and he went and served and helped them win many battles and conquer their enemies, and then when the war was over, he just returned to his farm quietly. And this, this organization was formed by veterans of the Revolutionary War, and George Washington was the head of it. But then it got attacked in the press as being some kind of an aristocratic thing. And George Washington was very sensitive about things like that. And so he declined to attend a big meeting of the Society of the Cincinnati. And he said that he was indisposed. He didn't want to embarrass them, but he didn't want rumors that he was joining an aristocratic society. Then the Constitutional Convention comes up, and he's going to attend that. And he thinks that'll make the society of the Cincinnati look bad. I won't go to that either. 
And James Madison got on his horse and rode several hours to Mount Vernon and talked him into it because James Madison knew how things worked. <laughs> You're going to have to come, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and he did come. And that's why they were able to build a strong executive. So now, what does James Madison say is the most important thing about the Constitution and the chief way it will protect our liberties? He says it makes ambition counteract ambition in order as a safeguard. That is true, and that's very good. Uh, how does it do that? That's what I'm asking. I think he says he puts reason instead of passion. That's true and very important. And how does it do that? What feature of the Constitution best achieves these things? Is this one of the obvious answers, like separation of powers? Yeah, which he says is the structure of the Constitution. In other words, there's no one provision. It's the whole thing. The structure is where, because it will channel the way we do politics to make that way the results healthier. The whole structure, right? And the structure is separation of powers. That's how it's laid out. And when he, when he gets ready to justify that, that's where he talks about the order of the human soul, which has to do with the arrangement of ra rationality and passions. It's worth adding that uh, uh, Madison didn't think, and the great philosophers don't think, that passions are to be banished. What you want is terribly important. And it's terribly important that you want the right thing. And every choice you make is a combination of thinking and desiring. And if you practice making choices well, you will come not only to think better, about how to get the right thing, but you will want the right thing. And so the Constitution in its structure is devised to engender the correct cooperation between reason and passion. And uh, that, in your own lives, you need to do that. You very much need to do that. A little short lecture. There are two kinds of virtues in uh, the, f the greatest book, in my opinion, ever written about ethics. The first book, Aristotle's Ethics. And uh, he says in there that there's two kinds of virtues, doing virtues and thinking virtues. And uh, doing virtues have to do with what you want. The doing virtues are three, the prime ones. They're uh, courage and moderation and justice. We'll take courage and moderation. Courage has to do with pain, and moderation has to do with pleasure. And the virtue is the right disposition toward those things. You have to want to do the brave thing. If you want to do what Aristotle says is the beautiful thing, the action that is beautiful to behold, if you want to do that, then you're courageous. But if you do it, like charge the enemy when there's no hope and no advantage to it, then you're a fool. You're imprudent. And it's not really a beautiful act then. It means that it takes thinking too. You have, to, you have to be able to figure out what to do. Pleasure is the same way. To attempt to forego all pleasure would be foolishness. You'd be giving up friendship. You'd starve yourself to death or something, right? But we're talking about here about a structure that channels the public control of the government in a way that encourages good character in the people. And the person they pick to be the chief executive is the person everybody thought was the greatest character.